anyway, the match was a Texas death match. No, it wasn't. It was billed as a Texas death match. It was what Tony Khan calls a Texas death match, and which is basically the same thing as every other AEW no DQ lazy booking match. Anything goes, there are no rules, and you can do anything you want to do. There's and there's no other goddamn difference in all of their fing matches. None of the Texas death match rules that were observed for 70 years before this apply. Well, I mean, to be fair, the rest of the matches on the show after this, none of the rules are really an application there <laughs> either. When it comes to tag team matches, everyone being in the ring in a tornado fashion, you see a lot of that. Well, but at least Nana got dancing girls. Can you explain to me why that they make the heels entrances so cool and have the the uh, cast of extras or the singers or the dancers or the rappers or the hippers or the hoppers and then the baby faces just wander out like fucking putzes. Maybe that's another reason why that they cheer the heels. That's the ultimate example of Mark booking. The idea that they think Swerve is going to be the cool heel, not realizing that cause and effect in 2023, it actually hurts everything if that's the way you present it. Well, I thought they were not as dancing girls. I guess Swerve had that entrance, too. The, the attention was on Nana and the dancing girls, not Swerve. I think Nana was the leader of the dancing girls. Hey! Uh, no, no, I'm not saying he's one of them. He's like their, uh, <laughs> what's, what's the main dancer, the choreographer of the dancing girls? He was the Tony Basil. That's right. Of the group. All right. <laughs> that's right. And then people love Swerve, and it's Swerve's house, and they like Swerve. And then to avoid being booed out of the building, apparently... Old Hangnail hit the ring with no music or introduction, and they began the fight. And immediately, they went to the floor. And within, what, well, after they rattled each other off the railing or whatever, within a minute, Hangnail stopped the match completely dead so that he could find a chair and go into the ring, get some duct tape, and then he got a staple gun. And he gets in the ring, and Swerve is having to sell this whole time, and then... <laughs> He puts his hands together and duct tape Swerve's wrist together. Obviously, did, does Swerve look like a, a guy to you that Paige would be able to duct tape his fucking hands together if he wasn't letting him? No. Okay. So then, old Hangnail gets a staple gun and staples Swerve's chest. He's stapling him in the titties. Not the nipples. Now, that, that's against the Geneva Convention. And then he gets a format or a piece of paper or whatever, and he staples it to Swerve's arm. Now, meanwhile, Brian, you know what a staple gun looks like. Now, you worked in an office. Of course. Do, do you think most of the people know what a staple gun looks like? It's a big metal thing, and you squeeze it, and it's got the thing goes across your fingers, and you squeeze it, and it staples, right? Right. If you're in a fight with a motherfucker, especially if you look like Adam Page and the other motherfucker looks like Swerve Strickland, and you've got a staple gun in your hand, are you going to staple him in the titty or are you going to draw back and punch him in the bridge of the fucking nose with it? But it's a metal object. Yes! That's the idea! He's got brass knuckles on his hand and he's stapling this motherfucker's arm! The fuck? And then he stapled his face and Swerve is letting him do it. And because we know that this is all fake because of the general overall presentation of AEW, people are sitting there going, well, this stupid motherfucker is letting this other stupid motherfucker staple his fucking cheek and his titties. And... <laughs> At that point, somehow he's busted Swerve open also, and Swerve hit a gusher and starts pouring blood. And this is where Paige lays down on his back as Swerve is bending over, bleeding from his head, lays down on his back and opens his mouth so that he can drink Swerve's blood to show how badass he is. And I believe at that point, you know, 
again, I go back to when Lyndon Johnson said after Cronkite came back from Vietnam, if we've lost Cronkite, we've lost America. I think they've lost the female audience that they might not have had to begin with on that one. And, and they might have lost the network that they potentially might or might not have had off of that one. What, you fucking idiot. Just, he's no better than the plumber or the fucking bank-addicted drug robber. He got more hair, that's it, old Page. Otherwise, he's as stupid and demented and fucking distasteful. So then... He got a barbed wire wrapped chair. But while he was going to find that, because there's one of those lying under the ring at every wrestling event. Whose job is that, to wrap the chair? Well, and the thing is, by the time that they finish doing this, you can tell that the barbed wire is phony because they they take so many bumps in this and so hit each other with the chair wrapped in barbed wire and take the bumps on the boards wrapped in barbed wire and wrap the barbed wire around each other and tie each other up with it, that they would be ripped to shreds. And maybe the people in Los Angeles are not familiar with barbed wire. I bet there's a few neighborhoods out there that got some razor wire. But anybody that's ever been within 10 miles of a fucking farm knows that you know you would have you would look like you were a tomato thrown through a screen door if that barbed wire was legitimate so all of their wounds mostly appeared to be self-inflicted but nevertheless then here's how stupid they both are and how page he will never get over if they fucking stick a tube of helium up his ass and inflate him like the Hindenburg, he will never get over. Because he doesn't know how to be a babyface. He keeps stapling Swerve. So Swerve, the heel, hulks up and doesn't sell the stapling. And takes the stapler while it's in Paige's own hand. And turns it around and makes the babyface staple his own fucking face. Can I repeat that? He made the baby <laughs> face holding the staple gun staple his own fucking face. So then. Very Three Stooges-esque. Oh, well, and then Mo leveled Curly. Hey. Sweetenly. And then Swerve gets the staple gun and just walks around the ring stapling himself over and over while he's laughing about it. So now they started and killed the staple gun in fucking five minutes. And then Swerve pulled out a concrete block and put it on the apron of the ring and gave Hangnail a Death Valley driver on the apron on top of the block. And he actually did land night. He caught some of the ropes on the way down to kind of deflect it a little bit, but the motherfucker landed him back of his shoulders first on the block which is a perfect fucking spinal treatment if you're a professional athlete and expect to use your body for several more years. And then Swerve gave Hangnail a pile driver on the top edge of the barricade, and then Hangnail got him some color. And this time, I guess because in the past he's been accused of being trepidatious of the blade, he... He went asshole to appetite on this one. Now they're both pouring the blood. And so now at this point, they get in the ring and start doing wrestling moves to each other. <clears throat> and by the way, every once in a while, they will, uh, they will let the referee count them. But whether they're shot by the bazooka or run over by the Sherman tank or hammered by the rainbow bread truck or whatever, they always seem to get up by seven or eight. And then finally, Hangnail puts a loop of barbed wire around Swerve and ties his arms, allegedly ties his arms, and that's another giveaway. If that was wire, you don't need to try to tie it. All you got to do is crimp it. It's like a heavy-duty version of your goddamn uh, loaf of bread tie. You crimp it a time or two, it'll stay. 
But he puts the loop around and ties his arms and then body slams him on it. And I wrote, my God, I can't wait for this to be over. But apparently we had to. Then uh, Hangnail gave Swerve a tombstone on the barbed wire chair. And the referee was counting to 10. Of course, Swerve got up at 8 or 9, which was actually about 30 seconds. So now we know that if you get tombstoned on a metal folding chair wrapped in barbed wire by Hangnail Page, you'll be up in the time it takes to watch a TV commercial. And they better hope that nobody watched this at all or they might as well fold their fucking tent. That uh, was my notation at the yeah. time. It was the biggest crowd in months. Yeah, well, there you go. So at the exact wor worst time possible, they draw a crowd to see this fucking abortion. So then Swerve powerbombed the fucking idiot on the barbed wire chair and then hit the double stomp off the top rope on the barbed wire chair on him. And then Swerve brought in a bag of broken glass and poured it on top of Hangnail and then went to the top rope and gave him a 450-degree splash off the top rope. Why would you do that? Why would you willingly hurt yourself to kick the shit out of somebody? It's so fucking stupid and childish. They act like they're in a video game. And none of this is real, and they aren't really fucking human beings. Did you see Dax, old Dax Hardwood, our friend in FTR? <laughs> did you see what he tweeted this morning? I did not. The morning after picture. He, he's he got, his head was busted open. I couldn't tell whether it, because it was Twitter and it was small, whether it was a stitch or two in there and a black eye and dings on his head. And it was just a close-up of his face, and he was tweeting, you know, I wonder what the the business people in first class on this plane that I'm on, because he's sitting on the plane, think about my face, but that's what we go through for the love of the sport and the uh, whatever the fuck, right? Positive uplifting. I said, if there's anybody in the goddamn wrestling business in first class, they probably think you ought to find some fucking opponents that can work and a goddamn booker that realizes you're human beings and not video game characters. Because they're all beat up and they're all hurt and they're destroying their body for this fucking richy rich motherfucker to masturbate over his live action toys and they're not smart enough to fucking prevent their goddamn demise at his hands. Because they think this shit's good. I'm not talking about Dax now, I'm talking about these other nitwits. I sympathize with Dax for being in the ring with his tag team partner Ricky Starks, and five other goofy motherfuckers that can't work. But anyway, we had broken glass in there now. So then... Broken glass. Everywhere. Everywhere. And mustard. So then Swerve pulled in a barbed wire-covered plywood sheet and put it across two chairs, but somehow they ended up on the top rope and Hangnail gave him the fall-away slam through all of that, which he went through it as well, and hopped right up and then gave him a power bomb on the board, and then the dead eye on the board where he drops the guy head first. And then he wrapped the barbed wire around Swerve's neck, and his Swerve stood up because, of course, after naturally, what do you do after you've been fall away slammed off the top rope through a board with barbed wire stuck between two chairs, and then power bombed, and then dead eyed? But you stagger up, you fucking moron. And then he hit the buckshot lariat on Swerve with the wire around Swerve's neck. And you'll never guess what happened, Brian. Swerve was almost counted out. But fortunately, Nana pulled him to the floor where he... See, he pulled him out and Swerve just stood up on his feet. After all of that, he's like, oh, fuck, I've got barbed wire around my neck. And then suddenly... Brian Cage, that goddamn fucking giant meat whistle, fucking just hits the ring out of nowhere and attacks Page right in front of the referee and starts kicking the shit out of him. Well, if that's okay, why did he wait till Swerve almost bled to death? Where are Page's friends? 
Well, yeah, it had, he had, well, there you go. He just told on himself, Adam Page does not have one single solitary swinging dick in that locker room that will come out and prevent him from getting filleted by like a fish by three people. They literally just did that with MJF on Dynamite, where he got his ass kicked by Bullet Club Gold and no one came out to save him because he hasn't made a deal with Joe and no one else wants to help him. Once again, Adam Page gets his ass kicked. Where are the Bucks? Where's Omega? Where's anyone? No one comes out. Where's the dork order? Where's his lawnmower? So Cage, it wasn't like Cage interfered and jumped out. He just takes over the match. And then he he gives Page a power bomb and a buckle bomb and an F5 and then pulls out a table. But Page gets the barbed wire after all of those moves and gets up and beats Cage up with the barbed wire. And then here comes Nana. And Nana hits Paige with a chair. And Paige bows up, which you should when the manager uses a gimmick at some point. That's an acceptable spot. Of course, not from a, a corpse, because Paige should have been dead five times already. But then he takes Nana out on the apron and gives him the dead eye off the apron through the fucking table. Why... <sighs> God damn it, if you were writing, number one, personally, like I said, Nana's the only person in this whole equation that I give a shit about. I hope he's okay. Secondly, if you were writing the manager out for months or maybe ever, do that. But it, just to do that, then if he's back on TV in the next six weeks without extensive physical rehabilitation, then it just makes Paige look like a weak fuck that he did. The poor Nana, who's, well, I don't want to reveal Nana's age. He's very young looking, but he's been around for 20 years. He's 65 years old. Quit now, stop. He's not. From Queens. Oh, come on, he's not 65 years old. He may be from Queens, but he's not 65. But anyway, point being, why would you do that and he's going to walk out on TV in the next week or two? Because Paige is a fucking moron and doesn't know no, anything not. about wrestling or baby facing. He's not going to walk out on TV. He's going to dance out on TV. Well, there you go. And he can't wear a neck brace because that's Roderick Strong's gimmick. So you fucking moron, Paige, by the way. Okay, back to this. Then, as he's done that to Nana, Swerve gets the, the fake fucking cinder block and breaks it over Paige's head from behind. And it just it, it, it explodes into powder. It looks like the old manager threw the powder spot. You can't do that to a real cinder block with a sledgehammer. And then he takes a chain, a big old logging chain, and wrapped it around Paige's neck and threw it over the top turnbuckle and it didn't look as good as the dirty white boy and fucking Horner and Smoky Mountain or the dirty white boy and Tom Pritchard in Continental. But he hung Paige by the neck until the referee counted him out to 10. Technically, Paige was still on his feet. And imagine, Brian, I'll leave you with this one. Imagine if that visual had been reversed and the white cowboy from Virginia had been pulling that chain around the neck of the black rapper from Seattle or wherever he's from up there. No, they could never do that. Well, it was a goddamn difference. You're doing a lynching on goddamn television to add to all this other shit. Oh, again, that was something you got you got by with in the territory days because it was local television and there, everybody involved was this, the same complexion. But then, again, what the fuck just ended with a, a lynching of any human being after this? the rest of this distasteful, unprofessional, and incredibly phony yet dangerous bullshit? Were you surprised Adam Page didn't win? I, I was astonished, Adam Page. <laughs> the fucking baby face loses the, the blow-off. 
Well, is this the blow off? I guess that's the question. What will be the third match? What? AK 47s at 10 paces. What else can they do? Gum Alley. <laughs> I, I don't know what they could do, but the fact that he lost, I can't imagine this is how it ends. The guy went to his house. And then he lost? Is he going to move well, on? Well, yeah, because then any guy went to Swerve's house, he got his ass beat. <laughs> Looks like Paige is going to stay home and send his baby to live with Swerve at this point. Do you have the time? Do you know how long it went? Uh, uh, three or four days. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. I wish I did know, because it did go on a long time. I, it gets I mean, Swerve, it, with those fans, it gets Swerve more over, and he's been only getting more and more over, does nothing for Adam Page. And it does nothing for any audience they don't already have. That's what, that's everything they do prevents them from getting any audience well, they don't already have, because this is the sum total of people that will watch bad, phony, silly, gymnastic, wrestling in quotation marks well, that's the thing wwe they give you the minimal amount on their television shows but with overarching stories and characters and people they're presenting as stars AEW, you get either just guys working matches or just complete brutality and the question is does this again it's on pay-per-view so you're kind of preaching to the choir in terms of who your audience is for this specific event but does brutality cause people to become wrestling fans or does characters, promos, personalities, star power cause them to become <laughs> pro wrestling fans? Characters, personalities, star power make a large percentage of the fans. There's always going to be somebody that sees something and goes, oh, you know, I got to watch more of this. But the... the I think the justification in some of these morons' minds for doing this is because they go, oh, well, there was Abdullah the Butcher and there was the Sheik and there was all the always violence and, you know, Wild Bill Longs and hit people with chairs or whatever. Context matters. Presentation matters. The reason why those things got over with those people in those times was because the fans a could believe the individual that was doing it was doing it they weren't all smart they weren't it wasn't all see-through it wasn't all obvious it was not just some buggy whip armed yahoo that was allowed to come in and wreak havoc and bust people open or fucking had go crazy. It was people who looked like they fit the part and could carry it off. And it was presented as a serious thing on the television program in the buildup. And it was not overdone week after week and everybody was allowed to do it. And as well, they've lost the plot completely on how to position the guys on their roster and in their matchups instead of just for the mark fans who want to oh golly i bet that's going to be a great match and that's going to be they're going to really work hard to have some emotional investment in wanting to see someone attain something someone to win and someone to lose brian you're a bass a baseball fan right and bass yeah a basketball fan, but mostly baseball. I, I started baseball. to say basketball is what I mean. You see, you're being I smart. I love basketball. It's a great movie. No, I love baseball. All right, you love baseball, but we know you like the Mets, right? I love the Mets. Who's your second favorite team? There is no second favorite team. Okay, well, let me ask you this. You love baseball. You love to watch the Mets play. Absolutely. Okay, who are the two worst teams in the goddamn league? The worst teams in the league? Yeah. Oh, geez. Uh, well, the Marlins actually had a pretty good year. We're going uh, division by division. Arizona it, made it to the playoffs. Well, you okay, you don't have to know. Who are two crummy teams? Two crummy teams in the past year. The Cardinals uh, had a pretty crummy year, even though traditionally they've been pretty good. 
And uh, I guess you could say the Padres had a very disappointing year. Okay, you love baseball. The Cardinals and the Padres are on TV. You going to skip it or are you going to watch it? Depends. It depends on what else is on. But if there's nothing on, I would certainly put it on and have it on in the background. Sure. If something else is on, such as an all-night gas station or a fucking new Denny's opening. Well, if it's like a TV show I want to watch versus a baseball game not involving the Mets, I'll choose the TV show I want to watch. If it's the Mets, I find a way to watch both or I watch the Mets. Yeah, well, the point I'm trying to make is that in any contest or conflict or sporting event or game or match or fight or whatever, most people watch because they want one or the other side or team or entities to win, right? They don't right. just watch it because they, if you're a baseball fan, you don't watch every goddamn game that every major league team plays because it's goddamn baseball. You can't. I think typically that's right. I mean, there are fans who will watch a lot of games, but I think a lot of fans like their team, they watch their team's games. They may occasionally watch other teams and of course highlight shows, but Day to day, it's about your team. Yeah, so the point is you get people invested in a uh, one side or the other, and that is the foundation of wrestling, is to the reason why the heel babyface dynamic was invented back in the days of the Goldust Trio is because it helps sell tickets when naturally. Ali and Frazier was the biggest you know, event of its time in boxing because Ali was a an incredible polarizing figure, but there was somebody to root for and somebody to root against, depending on which side you were on on both sides. Or any rivalry in sports, so the University of Kentucky, University of Louisville, it's not just the game they're playing, it's who's playing it and how it's presented. And that's what they're just trying to do. Every goddamn wrestling trope as the kids say it or cliche or angle or deal or finish or uh, plagiarize and you know prostitute every you know wrestling thing that they've seen or heard of or watched on youtube and everybody's allowed to do everything and there's no contextualizing of who you're supposed to really root for and who you're supposed to be against the wwe has all those things now, people may violate that. They may not really hate Dominic. They'd like to just boo because it's cool. But they're still, they, they know whose side they're supposed to be on. They know who they're supposed to want to see win. It makes sense. In the hundred years leading up to when the wrestling business went to shit, it, it, you would, you were pretty much out of business if the people didn't know whose side they were supposed to be on, whose side the wrestlers were each on, and why they were mad at each other. That's And then you could do anything from there. But the, Tony is just, because of his chemical brain makeup that has led to whatever medication he, again, he is on or needs to be on, it's just all about the, oh my God, these matches and these moves and this go, oh my God, it'll be so great, 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 great. And he's going to kill everybody. Not it. I'm not just talking about business-wise, I'm talking about physically. Well, of course, Jim, yeah. not everyone thought of it what you thought of it. I did hear from a lot of people who did like it. A lot of people thought it was the most brutal match in wrestling history, but I guess this will... It was brutal, all right. Here's brutal one example. Dave Meltzer tweeted out last night. Oh, I'm sure he did. Swerve won the death match after a cinder block shot and hanging him with a chain. This would have been remembered as an all-time classic if it, ended, if it ended without the interference. Maybe it will be, even with. So do you think Brian Cage's interference took away from this match's status as an all-time classic? Well, <laughs> Boy, how how do I answer that question? No, this match would have been an all-time stinker regardless, but Cage's, yes, it did take it down even a further notch. How how low can you go with that stupid business in front of the referee and et cetera? But again, what... At some point, somebody has to 
try to be the adult in the room and tell these children, and I'm not talking about the world's oldest teenager, Dave Meltzer. I'm talking about somebody that that has got to go in there and say, look, you can't keep doing this shit. It's ridiculous. You're killing the business not only for for your own company, but for future generations. What's left to do? It's all phony and silly. It makes no sense. There's no control here. There's no context. And it's unprofessional, and you're going to get kicked off television doing this shit sooner or later. All of those things. But nobody will, because Tony's Richie Rich, and he's not used to Cadbury telling him no when he wants a second poached egg. Fuck. Well, that was a review of Swerve versus Page at AEW Full Gear, and uh, I know this is your show, but this is probably around the time we should transition to a sponsor. No, I don't. I'm not in the mood. I'm not in the mood to do a goddamn commercial either. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to make note of a few. Hold on, let me throw the rest of the pay per view notes across the room. No, no. We're going to make note of. We're going to make note. Come on. Of a say. Wait a minute. Hold on now. You hear that? I hear lawnmowers. No, sirens. Oh, no. Fire heard, engine coming down the road. I heard you're going to tear up your Going down the road. They're helping out. That's right. We're going to talk about it. We're going to review the AEW Full Gear pay-per-view other than the Swerve Hangman match, which we reviewed earlier in the show. Yeah, yeah. On another day in another dimension. I know this sounds crazy, and I'm going to say it now. You're going to hear some chainsaws. Oh, come you're on. Gonna, no, today they just showed up. The first time they've ever showed up on a Monday, they the just showed up. The Chainsaw Crew has never come on a Monday. It's the final end of the season cleanup, so they're cutting all the branches With and everything. With chainsaws? Well, for some of the, we have a lot of uh, things. It's a, a big property. We have a lot I've of things. I've got a that, lot of fucking trees, too. I don't need anything chainsawed currently because we haven't had any storm. Have you had storms? No, this is the end of the season cleanup where they yeah, but this, what kind of season do you have where you're just chainsawing shit at the end of every season? Don't you keep on a regular basis? Keep your property fucking up or you got to come in there with a hazmat crew in November. No, there's not a chainsaw season. It just so happens that when they're getting ready to say goodbye until whatever, March or April. Well, it's time to say goodbye for the summer. We're taking our chainsaws away. No more wood will be cut this summer. Well, there it is, a double switch. You were in a bad mood, and I was in a good mood, and I think we've (laughs) completely changed that now. But Well, if we could talk about chainsaws instead of AEW. No, I'm serious. If you don't have like a storm or a catastrophe or something. Do you just have regular shit that needs to be chainsawed around there? I keep my property and we went and picked it up with a wheelbarrow the other day. There are some trees and things on the property that have a uh, specific look to it, a defined, (laughs) very special look. So they need some work that has grown enough this year since last November that it needs to be chainsawed. Yes, in one year. Again, this is the what, last time what, they're coming here until What are you, March a goddamn April. botanical science experiment up there? What can you grow in a year that needs to be chainsawed? And again, if you're using bone meal, things grow faster. Bone meal? Like, like I said, the different trees, and, and I hate to use the word shrubs, but indeed shrubs as well. <laughs> Rubbery and gets chainsawed? They put a giant tarp on the one part of the lawn where there are no leaves, so they could put all the other leaves there. They're getting ready for this transition of leaves. As we transition <laughs> into another season, and of course, another pay-per-view event. My guys brought two uh, giant trailer loads off the fucking thing. They're going to put yours in a fucking tarp? Well, the first round. And I've still got more. Now they've come down. The oak tree has come. The red oak's coming down now. So you, you, we got that. We're going to be back out here again and uh, weekend after next. Sounds but, like it, sounds like you need a chainsaw. You can't chainsaw the leaves. The red oak is coming down. Well, let's bring it down. Oh, for heaven's sake. All right. And now I want to talk about the pay-per-view. Anything to get off your fucking chainsaw, Chris? Tell Chainsaw Charlie I said hello. Let me ask this question of you. Was one of the two or three pretty much most promoted matches with interviews and angles and drama and back and forth and such and such, 
on this thing, the MJF and Samoa Joe versus the Gun Boys, the Ass Boys for the Ring of Honor Tag Team title. That was one of the more heavily plugged matches, wasn't it? I don't know if it was one of the more heavily plugged matches. It was certainly because it's a part of the Talked big about. key. Yeah, it's part of the big key storyline. They've been teasing the stuff with MJF and Joe for weeks. But they've done this before where all the stuff MJF's doing on TV, it starts in the pre-show for some reason. Yes, and that's what it did again with that match was on the pre-show. They had a four fucking hour, actually, no, I tell a lie, three hours and 56 minutes pay-per-view so they put an hour of matches on before that to burn out the live crowd and in the process i told you this uh i think your cable so well you don't watch this on cable even do you watch this through the mysticism of the uh streaming the bleacher report app that way warner brothers discovery gets a nice cut yeah well fuck them I want to be comfortable, so I'm on the couch watching the 75-inch, and I got the pay-per-view, and I bought the pay-per-view and set to record the pay-per-view, and then that afternoon, for whatever reason, I can't even remember, maybe I checked to see if you had tweeted any clips, but I saw that it's on the pre-show, that match, so I go down to see if the pre-show is available, and it's it's two 30-minute blocks on my Spectrum cable pay-per-view, titled Countdown. And it doesn't have any information on what it's counting down to, and there's a blank square where the thumbnail should be. And if you didn't know that you were ordering a pay-per-view or a pre-show to a pay-per-view, it would not tell you in any way. Not AEW Countdown, just Countdown. Just Countdown. It's like the typical, remember the old days, the Barker Channel, where they aired a pre-taped you know, uh, infomercial for in 30 minutes, you can order this pay-per-view and you got that free on the pay-per-view channel. And then it went black if you didn't order the pay-per-view. And that's what this is still set up like. And you would never even know it was there if you didn't already know that AEW was going to do some kind of pre-show before the show show. So anyway, I recorded that too. And wouldn't you know, it was on the second half or the second episode of Countdown from 7.30 to 8. But again, it, what the what, the world champion and the featured angle that it's on a pre-show. And wouldn't that be something that if you said it's going to open the pay-per-view, folks, to give MJF plenty of time in the middle, then it would be an attraction to for people to buy the fucking show, not the free part. Not disagreeing with you, but playing devil's advocate. If the argument is doing this on the pre-show, the way it was done, the way it was a cliffhanger, was done specifically to build late buys for the pay-per-view, do you think that's a reasonable argument? No, because I think they fucking shoved themselves off the cliff because they told the people that the champ, defending champion in the main event was hurt, and he'd just been stretchered out and taken into an ambulance. So I guess he's off the show. What the fuck? How is that a fucking... They would have had to tell people, well, but you know, he saw that episode of Raw 25 years ago where Austin went to the hospital, hijacked the ambulance, and came back. I don't... <sighs> the point is... They have the match. They get the heat on MJF. They give Joe the hot tag, and he makes the big comeback. And then they do their back and forth. And uh, there was some tension between Joe and MJF. That was well done. This was not a bad match for telling the story of the angle. It was very good for that. I'm just, I question the placement and the whole nine yards of what the fuck they've done this evening. But uh, MJF and Joe were both excellent, and the guns are, you know, young. Well, I guess they're not as young. They're not like teenagers, but they're very good for their experience level. Anyway, but, you know, they got to do a little gaga, so they hit their finish on Joe, the guns did. MJF saved him, the guns stopped him, and then Adam Cole's music plays. 
And because Adam Cole hobbles out on crutches, the guns are gobsmacked and stand there until Joe comes up behind one of them and chokes him out. And they win. But what? <clears throat> he's on crutches and he's immobile and he was 100 feet away. Was there imminent danger that they had to stand there like they, they'd just seen the creature from the Black Lagoon? What's the other option to continue to beat up their opponent? Yeah, the guy they're actually in a fight with that has two good legs and might come back and choke them out. I can see how that would have worked out better. Yeah. If it was a if it was Brock Lesnar coming down the aisleway, I might stand there, oh shit, but he's fucking crippled. <clears throat> anyway, so MJF and Joe shake hands. And and by the way, MJF was wearing the he's our scumbag shirt, but at the proper angle when he was standing there, it, it looked like he's our cum rag. <laughs> I don't know why I saw that. So then the guns. What's wrong with you? I don't know. It's <laughs> I think it's the fluoride they've taken out of the water. Uh, the guns jump up and beat up MJF and get the chair and do whatever the fuck and hurt his leg while Adam Cole is standing there helpless because he can't do anything like he couldn't do anything 30 seconds ago because he's crippled. And the, basically they hurt MJF, they stretcher him out, and they show him being loaded into a waiting ambulance. I have not only been loaded into an ambulance by a legitimate ambulance EMT crew that was not smartened up to anything, but I've seen it also happen in legitimate situations. The, the goddamn Kennedy, when he was in Dallas, didn't get loaded into a goddamn ambulance this fast, right? Because they were running out of time on the pre-show. But a whoosh, it was standing by. We know somebody's going to get fucked up tonight, so we've got it with the engine running and boom and here we go so the the world heavyweight champion in the main event of the pay-per-view has just been taken to the ambulance on the free show and they end, and they end it with him being taken away yelling at adam please don't let them take away my championship and you have adam yes. Cole looking conflicted yes like what am i gonna do about this shit so again i think for aew not justifying it, their thought is this is not only part of the overall storyline, but hopefully putting it here would cause someone at home to say, what's going to happen now? If MJF can't wrestle, what's going to happen in the main event? But I think most people probably figured he would somehow get back there, <laughs> don't you think? Well, yes, because this, uh, this, uh, this is being performed by fans of the Attitude Era for fans of the Attitude Era. It's it's a fucking cover band at this point, isn't it? Or a tribute band. It's like the <laughs> rumors of Fleetwood Mac is, you know, whatever. So the pay-per-view comes on the air. And they recap the ambulance spot. And then they had a women's choir singing for Christian Cage, the heels. The heels again get the singers and the, I love to sing ya. About the moon and the June and the spring, uh, and then we dance, uh, and the prance, and the, it's, it, it's a fucking musical smorgasbord. So, having said that, the opening match of this show was, uh, in retrospect, the only thing that resembled a wrestling match up and down the card the whole fucking nine yards. It didn't get in its own way. You had... Clear heels and baby faces. You had an issue. Even with in that group, even old Nick Plain looks like a you know the flunky that he is, so that's fine. He fits. He had flair at ringside. And Christian Cage is the smartest man in wrestling, I think, at this point, because he can go out there and have a safe match, at least for him and everybody he cares about. Darby's on his own. And and it gets over and it makes sense and it's a wrestling match and there's star power in it and they and they went on first so that the rest of these yahoos couldn't fucking kill the audience for them and I think and the crowd loved it because the baby faces are over so I think this was the match 
And Edge even did the thing where he painted his face like uh, staying in Darby like Dusty used to do with the Road Warriors or whatever. Steve-O from Jackass was at ringside. Do you notice WWE gets the celebrities and AEW gets the jackasses? Did you hear what Steve-O said at the end of the pay-per-view? I, I did not. This event was the most painful thing I've ever done. <laughs> I'm not surprised because mental anguish is even worse than physical excruciality. So, you know, that Sting did a little bit, but not, you know, he didn't kill himself or anything like he shouldn't. Uh, Cage stayed away from Edge as much as possible. They put the fucking lizard size over. Darby Allen will take any kind of bump, so we excuse him from, you know, doing stupid shit, but, and they kept it moving. And then, you know, finally, um, at one point, Darby made an ice cold tag to Edge, but people popped because it was Edge. And everybody did all their shit. And then Flair and Cage got in a fight at ringside, and Cage nutshotted Flair and tried to hit Edge with the belt, but he hit the lizard instead. And Edge chased Christian out of the fucking picture, and the baby faces gave their finishes to Dino, and Edge pinned him one, two, three. Again, it it made sense. And and Cage comes away as as the the most unharmed heel on this program because he was neither cheered nor made to look like a complete fucking buffoon. But your thoughts, you know, I thought it was actually a really fun match and I agree with you. It was a good way to open the show. And even flair, I thought he was pretty good at ringside. The only biggest problem with flair beyond, you know, the rapiness and uh, the, yep. bad, the bad energy drink and all that. It's so upsetting the way he dresses now. I thought he would be a stylish old man. Yeah, Bockwinkle, right? Bockwinkle, even Buddy Rogers, casual, stylish. Yeah, the, the, the no no tie necessarily, but the colored handkerchief hanging out of the bold blazer. No, now it's like Groucho coming out with the hat with those <laughs> fuzzy golf balls on it. <laughs> but Groucho, you have three balls. Yeah, Groucho, why are you wearing tie-dye? No, uh, that's the only problem. I thought it was a fun and, match. And also, though. he's an inexperienced manager. He stood all night in the neutral corner. Is it hard to be a manager? If you're used to being the center of attention and getting, not getting yourself over, but being over and everything you do gets a reaction, if you put that person at ringside, is it a hard thing to do to t not take away from the match? Well, I don't, I don't know because I've always been in the other category, but I think <laughs> it must be because I see a lot of people struggling with it. And it, and it is, it's a different thing. It's like, you know, refereeing is a completely different thing positioning and the things you should do and shouldn't do. And as, so it's all different things. And as we've seen, sometimes not all great wrestlers make great managers or, you know, uh, great promos don't necessarily make great announcers or whatever the case, but, but nevertheless, but he never um, walked into Michaels of Kansas city and said, give me the psychedelic cow. No, <laughs> Chick-fil-A uh, on <laughs> fucking LSD. Yeah, the 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 bonanza pattern, please, but in pastels. I I I don't know what might have happened. You know, but hey, styling and woo, ignoring all the mirrors. There was at one point he might be wearing a shroud at this time, so let him let him wear what he wants all right. for heaven's sake. The shroud of flair coming soon to uh. Torino, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> We're just amusing ourselves now because it's, yeah. it's those are such deep cuts. Um, anyway, maybe somebody will cut a piece of one of Flair's suits off and analyze it to see if it's legitimate. So Jay White came out with Tony Schiavone in the entrance way, and they had awkward interplay, let's say, and. Here is now, here's now what they're doing with the main event. Help me on this, Brian, if, if I don't explain it properly. Tony Schiavone says that MJF is injured and he can't defend the AEW title tonight in the main event. Therefore, the match is canceled and Jay White is the new champion by default. 
Is that what they initially yeah, said? That's what they said. And I think it's a smart thing. I mean, luckily they haven't done anything with interim championships over the last four years to establish that as the go-to thing when anyone gets hurt. So it made sense. It, 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 exactly, uh, Groucho. That has never happened ever when all of these other champions have been. How many champions have they had get hurt? And they, okay, well, then this guy's going to wrestle this guy or this girl against this girl. And the winner will be the interim champion, Punk. And the goddamn, the girls did it. But then Adam Cole's music plays and he comes out. And he says that not only will he defend MJF's belt for him, but Tony Khan said it was okay. So delving a little deeper here. Adam Cole and MJF are the Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. But Adam Cole is not medically cleared to compete in the wrestling ring and defend the title, so MJF, his good friend, is defending them for him because he's half of the champions. We've gone that far, right? Right. But now, Adam Cole is being allowed by Tony Khan even though he's not medically cleared to defend the tag team title he actually has, he's good enough to defend a title that he's never had to begin with. <laughs> While he's on crutches in a fucking cast. And this is the replacement main event that they tease everybody with. And by the way, now that he's not actively wrestling, clearly not tanning, he's even growing his beard a little bit. Oh, good God, he's not washing his hair. He looks 50. He doesn't look like a wrestler when he comes out there. He looks like the wrestler's friend or manager. And No, hey, fuck you. Well, well his I never went out on TV looking like that. He's got his hair is dark and motley or greasy, and it's pulled up in a fucking top knot. He's got a scraggly, unkempt beard. It's all di He was a good-looking young man. And now he's pale and and unshodden and what the fuck he looks 50 that's the thing if you know you're going to be at the pay-per-view even if you're not going to work i mean everyone else has one get a take a tan. shower that morning well, well, I don't, take a shower get a tan i was going to say not take a shower take a shower it was just, <laughs> god damn <laughs> what do you think of jay white's reaction to thinking he was going to be the world champion for this bullshit reason it, I didn't care, and actually, he started talking, and I just fast-forwarded out of this. What else did he say? Nothing much. He was just very excited momentarily, thinking it was going to happen, and of course, it didn't happen, and fans at home were told to expect this new main event. It was Jay White like, versus a one-legged man. I mean, the MJF stuff, in a lot of ways, was booked like a dynamite this week, on, well, this week, on this pay-per-view. Well, if brains were dynamite, they couldn't blow their nose. And speaking of blowing it even further, <laughs> you know, I've got it. I said the six man tag was at least the, the closest thing on the show to a wrestling match, but I didn't enjoy it more than everything. I, there was one thing that I have to, I have to admit, I enjoyed much more than I thought I would. The women's three way? No. Oh. And if I was going to enjoy a women's three-way, it probably wouldn't be these three women. But for the mascot title, the plumber versus pockets, the teacher's pet versus the fucking wrestler's regret, and Moxley finally gets his fucking comeuppance that he's deserved for a long time now with his rotten wrestling and his garbage wrestling-minded ways. Did you see any of this? I did because I wanted to see if I was right, and I was right. Orange Cassidy yeah. went over. Well, but no, but that's not the story. The story is that Moxley obviously was like, you motherfucker. And hearing he had to do this, even though he's getting paid a couple million dollars, put the fucking mascot over. He is the worst wrestler in the world, but he's got a name. People know him. He's been a world champion, and he's a, portrayed as a main event guy here. And he's got to put over the fucking boss's pet fucking pet action figure. And he, you could tell from the start, he was, he beat the fuck out of this guy. He didn't sell shit. 
He took bumps and got right back up if he did go down. If it had been any other fucking wrestler in the world beating the idiot up like this, I would have loved it, but especially seeing the plumber because I knew as soon as I saw that that you were going to be right. And, of course, he still bled. He still bled. I don't think fucking Pockets did it to him. I think he just, hey, no. It was when they were, he was headbutting Pockets. He busted himself open. Well, he came out with a big bandage on his head. Yeah. <laughs> he probably, in, to avoid the criticism of being seen by God and everybody, taking the fucking gimmick to his head, he probably bladed in the locker room and new skinned it or whatever. But nevertheless, he went through the motions of selling for the guy a few times, but he didn't. And he beat the shit out of the little fucking goof the whole time. The, except the, in a working way most of the time, because the strikes, in quotation marks in this, were some of the phoniest ever. But it looked like bum fights with the one guy with the fucking blue jeans and the plumber just with that face and physique. It looked like that what was it, a pay-per-view series or was it a DVD series where they'd get homeless bums to fight for $10 or whatever? Uh, both. I think eventually they did get on pay-per-view. Well, there you go. But finally, Moxley got run into the bare turnbuckle that had had the pad taken off of it head first, not once but twice, and then took six of Roman Reigns' finish, the Superman punches, of course, none of them connected, actually. He whiffed every one of them like he always does with his buggy whip arms. I think when he jumps up in the air, the wind blows pockets off course. He's so fucking skinny. And then Moxley laid down for him one, two, three. And it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. The plumber goes down the drain. What the fuck? <laughs> Oh my God, can you imagine how fucking pissed he was to hear that this was going to happen? Moxley, I'm talking about. He had to know it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. It was obvious this was going to be the result. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be like an Ultimate Warrior Randy Savage thing where uh, Savage had to hit the Warrior with like eight elbows or whatever, or five elbows <laughs> to pin him. He just kept punching Moxley over and over, and it's the biggest self-fulfilling prophecy in AEW, Orange Cassidy. And I told you, they're not going to stop until they put the world title on him. <sighs> Tony is not going to stop until he gets the world title on Orange Cassidy. Well, I can't. You know what? I may buy that pay-per-view twice to see that, just so that we can see the end of Tony's, uh, probably not only his company, but also his freedom. I think he'd, what is it, a 5150 they'd get him on? Or is, is that a drive-by shooting? I'm not up on all my fucking police codes, but. Some type of involuntary hold over at the, a rubber room at the puzzle factory. Anyway, I can give you the finish of the AEW women's title between timeless Tony Storm and Hikaru Shida. Would you like me to? You know her name's Hikaru Shida. Why'd you call her Hikaru? Tony Storm called her Hikaru the other day, didn't she? Did she? I don't know. I've been watching the Tony well, Storm. Well, say, there you go. So the referee is Aubrey Ed, right? And she had her main colored, I think, for this occasion. It's a big show. Well, Sheeta goes to hit Tony. They're down on the floor, and Sheeta goes to hit Tony Storm with the kendo stick, but she does the deal where she draws it way back over her head behind her, and she's going to come down with the Paul Bunyan swing, and old Luther, who... <laughs> Finally, at least he's doing something for his fucking check after four years. But Luther is supposed to grab the kendo stick, but he misses. And she does starts to swing and expects to feel a tug. And I've been there. I've been there on this spot. And she don't feel the tug and she swings over. And, and before she can stop herself, she does hit Tony Storm right in front of the referee. And the referee just says, nay, I won't disqualify you. And then Sheeta turns around and kicks Luther in the balls and beats the shit out of him with the stick. By the way, I think they ought to get a new sponsor for this program. The people that do goddamn vasectomies. 
How many people were violently struck in the goddamn testicles over the course of this five hours of insanity? Well, I don't know. I didn't keep count. Over and over and over. So anyway, beat up Luther and Tony Storm. Did you see the finish of this? No. Okay. Well, then this is what I got on you. You know, Luther is Tony Storm's butler because she's the old of the day's golden era of Hollywood movie star, right? I thought he was Jericho's butler. No, no, no. He was he was Jericho's gopher. No, that's what I'm saying. He's Tony Storm's butler. And 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 he is he's he's the Eric von Stroheim in Sunset Boulevard. And he's got the tray that is on the that he carries around Tony's various implements on, right? And it's a metal tray, and it's round, and it maybe it maybe it might be the size of a, well, not even a, a twelve inch in between a forty five RPM and a thirty three and a third RPM record, probably about the size of an old seventy eight. So Brian, I've narrowed it down for you. Everybody else is goddamn lost. It's a metal tray. While the referee is dealing with Luther getting a shit kicked out of him with his fucking kendo stick, she takes the tray. And you know, like when the masked man used to put a metal object in his mask to load the headbutt? Right. Or a guy that has a glove or an elbow pad, then they use an elbow drop or a punch or whatever, they'd load that. What does Tony Storm use for a finish, Brian? Do you remember? Does she put something on her ass and use her ass as the battering ram? She loaded her ass, ladies and gentlemen. She put the tray and stuffed the butler's tray in the back of her tights. But here's the thing. She didn't then just run and do it. They continued wrestling. And the metal tray started shifting. And it, by the time it was uh, 30 seconds had passed, it was sticking out of the bottom of one of the leg holes of her tights. And then by the time she goes back in the corner to run and do the ass in the face, they've got a camera shot on it. This thing is barely in her tights. It's hanging out of her fucking ass cheek. And she does the ass in the face and covers fucking Sheeta. And Aubrey counts while she's looking at a metal butler's tray sticking out of fucking Tony Storm's ass cheek. One, two, three. New so champion. that was unique. New it was champion. unique. Yeah, new champion. New boss. She's had it before, though, but now she's timeless now, so she's got it again. But she needs a, a pair of fucking tights, apparently, that are assless, not timeless. Should there be an ass championship in AEW? <laughs> if all the women have their asses hanging out, why not give them a belt? Well, no, I wouldn't mind their ass hanging out, but I, I hate the fucking gimmick hanging out. It's like Tommy Young told me when Brute Bernard worked for Crockett in the mid seventies, Tommy would started wrestler or started refereeing at that point, right? And Brute Bernard was the crazy guy, and ooh, 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 and he bald head and ugly face, and he was wild. And he said, Tommy said, one night they're at a fucking show somewhere, and Brute Bernard takes a bump out of the ring and he sees a board laying there from the ring crew or whatever, like a two before, about three feet long. And he picks it up and he sticks it in the back of his tights like he's hiding it behind him, right? But it's sticking a foot over his head. And fucking Brute comes back up on the apron as Tommy's, what the fuck are you doing? Brute says, don't see it. <laughs> it's fucking, it's tall enough you could hang his fucking hat on it. He wouldn't be able to find it. I love when Brute anyway. Bernard showed up in Memphis and... There's a video of it. I guess it was before 79, yes. probably 77, uh, 78. 19, it was the, no, it was the summer of 1977, and that video exists because I salvaged it, but go ahead. Well, just he gets on the mic and is just, ah, just screaming into the book while he's wobbling his leg. Yes, that's when they painted General Homer O'Dell, his manager, yellow. Remember, it was Armand, Hus Armand Hussein and Plowboy Frazier, and they were wrestling, and I think, Bold Eagle may have been in there also, and they were wrestling uh, the Angel, Frank Morrell, and Brute Bernard, and General Homer O'Dell was the field marshal, and some way a bucket of yellow paint was introduced. I think they were going to paint a yellow stripe down Hussein's back, and the tables were turned, and O'Dell ended up goddamn covered in yellow paint. I didn't realize this was one of the tapes that you salvaged. 
Well, I kind of salvaged it because here's the thing. Lawler had saved about 10 or 12 three-quarter inch tapes of stuff that he had done, and that was on one of those shows. And I, I borrowed them from him and got them dubbed over to VHS in early 1980, probably. And I don't know if he still got his masters now, but uh, the copy floating around for years was from the one that I got. But nevertheless, should we move on? Yes. Yes. The four-team ladder match with Starks and Big Bill versus the House of Blick versus LaFuckers and Goobers versus FTR. And has there ever been a better tag team than FTR that almost never gets a chance to show how good they are? They're always either with the children or stuck in this multiple team, no rules, gaga or the stunt shows. And let's face again, whether it's, it's a four team match, it's probably not going to be any good. Then you put 15 ladders out there. And what it is, is again, another match that's phony as fuck and dangerous at the same time. It makes no sense. It goes on forever. There's no semblance of a contest or a conflict between entities or parties. It's a bunch of people cooperating to in turn take moves and bumps that are dangerous. And I, you know, I just got so bored watching it. You can't really even say, well, they did this and that, and they started the heat on, and this guy hurt his leg because it doesn't connect from one moment to the next. It's just over and over, crash, bang, boom. If I was going to try to notate everything wrong with it from a wrestling standpoint, it would have taken me as long to watch this match as the whole pay-per-view was. So, but have FTR now been neutralized and marginalized and neutered? They were so popular at one point in the team with Punk and the matches with Jen and Juice. And now Starks, who's a heel... Seemed to be the most popular guy in the match. I think the House of Black is in right now an indie level tag team that could probably do something with a lot of guidance, but not their own. And you know, the other team needs to find a different line of work. So LFI? Yes, LaFuckers and Goobers. You know how they got that name? How did they get that name? LFI no. I see what you did there. Hold on one second. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Tip the waitress, try the veal, or try the waitress and tip the veal. We don't care what you do. After about a million sloppy, dangerous bumps on ladders and furniture for no good reason in a match that nobody will remember next week, Starks knocked Cash off the ladder and got the belts. So, again, they even they beat FTR when they've got a goddamn microscopic masked Mexican on one of the other teams that could easily be knocked off at last that, who gives a shit? Nobody will even recognize him next week. He's, if he changes color of his outfit, he looks like everybody else. I mean, was there anything I missed here with this? I don't, what the fuck? I mean, it was a ladder match. We've seen a lot of these. They don't really stand out that much anymore. I think FTR need time off, not because of anything other than, is there anyone you want to see them wrestle right now? No. We'd rather see more of Starks and Big Bill, actually, right now. More than anything else, at least they're fresh. FTR have kind of exhausted their opponents and exciting things to do until something else happens. I mean, they've had a good run. But do you get excited about seeing FTR right now? Well, no. And that's... <sighs> Again, that's the problem. I would be excited to see a, a three out of five fall, 90-minute time limit rematch of that goddamn classic that they had that everybody said was the greatest tag team match they'd ever seen. But they've, they've sent Jay off to wrestle for a fucking title that he's not equipped to hold. And now Juice, they said Juice is hurt, right? He's injured. He wasn't on this show. That's what I uh, heard, yeah. So I'd be excited for that, but I'd also be excited just to see FTR in regular. They could have got a tag match 
out of Starks and Big Bill a real win instead of the schmas they did before when they lost the belts. They could have maybe got a fucking tag match out of the House of Black. But it's always the stunt shows, the furniture, and nobody's going to remember it. That's the problem, especially after everything else that goes on in this show. Plus, no one has any feuds. I mean, there are all these great yes. Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express matches. Midnight Express, Fantastics matches. Those are great matches. But there were feuds behind them. FTR have great matches. Have they had a great feud? And I know the matches with the Briscoes are great. Was that a great feud? Or was it like, we respect you, so we'll wrestle you again and see <laughs> who's the best man? That's with a different a stipulation. Yeah, and it can't be any more of like, I want you to be the best you've ever been. No, fuck that. No more of that shit either. Well, and, and there were never any angles. And part of that was because they couldn't put the Briscoes on TV. But it, it, wa it wasn't a feud. It was a trilogy of matches. But beyond the Briscoes, that's every FTR thing. Whether yeah. it's the Bucks, which took place over several years, Juice and Jay, which just happened. There's no feuds. It's like the well, feud but is, that, we you're... wrestled you and had a great match, so we need to do it again. That's our feud. There's no but feuds. But you're, you're back to talking about Tony's booking. Nobody has feuds. They have matches. Like we and... never, that's the one thing that separates, not, not the one thing, but when you look at FTR versus like the classic tag teams, Tully and R, Midnight Express, Heart Foundation, whoever gets thrown into the conversation, FTR have never done that. They've never just had a great feud with anyone other than like a feud based around winning and like just based around the actual match. Not like this guy did something to me. I'm going to get him or we did something. We're heels and we yes. do something to someone else. They're going to want to get us. It's never done. And I don't know right now. I mean, if Jay and juice isn't going to happen, it's not going to happen for a while. And I'm not as excited about Jay white right now as I was months ago. I think FTR, what is there for FTR to do right now that you'd want to see? Well, and that's the thing, is that nobody in this company has a strong rival. They had set things up in the past where it would have been Punk and MJF, or it would have been Danielson and who, but it, it, it gets dropped constantly. Tony... Tony has never done anything bad to anybody, and nobody's ever done anything bad to him because he's too rich. So he doesn't understand those principles. Yeah, the biggest feud, if you really think about it, is Swerve versus Hangman. Well, yeah, and, and, and those two idiots, as we now know, wrote that horrible shit on their own. Because how else can you explain it? It's totally unlike anything else Tony has done, and... and I never thought I'd say this, but that's a good thing. Well, certainly good for Swerve. He's getting over. We'll see about Adam Page, but... Terrorizing the babies. That was the uh, four-way tag team ladder match. All right, how about the three-way girls TBS title match with Blue Sky and Statlander and Julia Hart? I thought it was a fun little match. Well, nobody had a butler's tray hanging out of their ass, so I didn't watch it. But Julia Hart won the title. I know, and... Is it a good move to put the title on her to capitalize on what is obviously a growing fan interest in the heel? Well, I'm the one who said that they ought to put her with somebody that's a real main event talent and have her fucking with that group instead of fiddling around with the House of Black's uh, sorcery and kind of focus on her. I don't think she ought to be wrestling because then she looks like the fucking... You know, same as the rest of the AEW roster, except for Chris Statlander. She looks like she could hang with the WWE women's roster and is an athlete and a, a kick-ass kind of girl, and she didn't get hired just because she was somebody's friend. A lot of the other girls, as we know, especially the ones from the Land of the Rising Sun, had inside connections, but Julia Hart has a great look but I don't see her as a goddamn women's wrestling champion. It, at one point, and this is a three-way anyway, so if the guys can't do it, the girls can't do it. But they looked like three drunk chicks outside a bar at 3 o'clock in the morning fighting, fighting over an Uber. It was, it's just not... Why make it more difficult when they can't... Uh, let them have a good singles match before you try to put this three-way bullshit in on them. I'll say this, they put her with the House of Black from being a cheerleader 
and she was kind of in the background, she's more over than everyone else in that group. Well, yes. That's why I say get her out of that fucking group and put her with somebody where you could really focus around them. Anyway, uh, yeah. Julia stole it, though. Statlander had tombstoned Blue Sky when Julia stole the pen. Like a heel. Like a heel should. Yes. Well, and she and she also she's smarter than the average Stevie Nicks uh impersonator. So did did you love the big signing, the big announcement? <laughs> well, it was something kind of known. It wasn't a big surprise, although some people started to think at the last minute it could be Ronda Rousey, it could be Mercedes Monet, but most people knew it was gonna be Will Ospreay. And Tony Schiavone announced it and brought him out. And why? Uh, I mean, I can understand. Tweet it. Graphic. Will Ostrich is all elite or whatever. Why is this a big deal? It's a I wouldn't say it's a big deal. It's something, you know, that fans are excited about. But I think Tony's trying to steal, whether it's ratings or buys, He's trying to steal attention from people by throwing things out there that shouldn't be something you pay to see. Big announcement, major signing, what will it be? Find out on a pay-per-view. Tony has a big announcement this week, what will it be? And then it turns out to be nothing. They're just trying to hype people up to get them excited about what is a product right now that had the least amount of excitement around it than it maybe ever had. I'm not, I'm, well, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. And I'm going to say Osprey's good. And I think you always have fun with him but whenever you've watched him you've actually i think you've given pretty fair reviews of some of his stuff he's good and i think him being in the mix there is good he's a much better signing than akota ibushi well i'm not gonna say that's not true and i have to think if they're going back to wembley next year they're gonna put the belt on him at wembley that's gonna be my how do you get him to sign here versus wwe <laughs> we'll put the belt on you in your hometown i think that's what it is. <laughs> you know we may not be able to pay as much money, but we'll put the belt on you in your home. To, but I mean, I'm not, and again, I'm not saying they shouldn't sign him. It, with the rest of their roster, he fits right in. But again, they make this, they just signed fucking Edge and the ratings went down. And so they bring him out already like it's God as we we're signed. And then he says, oh, I'm going to beg you fans in that thick accent. I'm going to beg you, let me finish up with New Japan, and then I'll be here for you. So they brought him out so he could sign a contract in the ring and then go back to Japan for two months or whatever. If you've got a plan like that, you want to put the belt on him next August at Wembley, then come up with a goddamn plan. It's like when they started Vader at the Royal Rumble, even though they, they knew he had to have surgery. <laughs> Then he hurts Gorilla, gets suspended. He's off for three months after working there for three weeks. What the fuck? That's the first thing it derailed him. When Ostrich is ready, announce he's signed then. And instead of bringing him out like he's the biggest, they've just signed John Cena. Have him do something. Make a surprise appearance and make an impact of some description. Or whatever the case. Instead of just... Bring him out like he's God, because let's face it, they just signed Edge and the ratings went down, and Will Ostrich ain't Edge. And don't just trot him out like, oh, look at another thing we've just got that may or may not work out. And then he's gone for however long again. What the fuck? I don't understand what Tony is doing. It's just like, oh, look at the new toy I got. You don't know the band Sham 69, do you? I certainly don't. All right. I was watching this promo he did. I thought he sounded like Jimmy Percy, the lead singer, but you wouldn't get the reference, I guess. Jimmy Percy. Right. How, about, how about Percival Pinkerton? I'm so happy to be here, New Japan! See, this is going to be another problem. And I'm sorry to if I'm offending any of our fans across the pond, but that accent, it, it sounds like a lot of fucking guys on wrestling these days, and to us untrained ears they're all kind of alike and it don't come off the best i don't know i think he actually has a better accent than most because he sounds a little bit more street a little bit more hooliganish as opposed to all the posh i mean nigel's out he there. sounds like he needs to blow his nose 
I'm out here on a yacht with Tony Khan. And also, he was wearing a furry winter coat in Los Angeles. Why was that happening? He's stylish. All righty. Well, I guess we can skip right over that fucking thing we talked about earlier. Can I ask you one question about the thing we talked about earlier, the Swerve yeah. Hangman match? Considering what it was, is this where it should have been on the show? Or should it have, if it was going to be on the show and you can't just say cancel the match, should it have been here? No. This, make it, it, don't make it the main event. Make it a lights out match. Have your main event, and that way it would have been easier for uh, the the Cucamonga kids and their match, as well as MJF injured, and maybe he wouldn't have had to go 30 minutes, and, and then have a lights out match, no rules, we're not responsible. Because Lord knows most people would want to deny responsibility of that fucking match. Doesn't that make more sense? Instead of Showing him everything, including a fucking human sacrifice and drinking the blood of a fucking goat or whatever. And then, oh, and by the way, here's our angle for our main event. Yeah, I mean, there was no way to follow it. No matter who you put out there, there was no way to follow this. I don't think anybody will ever be able to follow it in this company again on any television program or any live event or anything for anybody that saw that. That's the bigger problem. Because that may be the reality, but how many wrestlers are going to now try to one-up this? Well, but the, I, I mean, they're welcome to try because it wasn't good. It's not like it's good and we got to top it. It was like there's nothing left to do, and it was so phony, it's killed everything. The, it's think, not like the old Roy Shire was chewing out Patterson and Stevens because they had a, too good of a match, and he'd never found another team as good as them. It was this was goddamn awful, embarrassing, phony, and... It, it, destroyed the illusion of everything you can do to a human being in a fucking wrestling scenario. You think we ever see the drinking blood spot again? Or is it now beyond the grossness of it too closely associated with this one specific match and Adam Page? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sure somebody in AEW will probably try to do it again just because Tony won't tell him no, but you're not going to see it in goddamn the WWE to begin with. You think Moxley was watching that match like, God damn it, I should have thought damn, of that. Oh, you know what? And that's another reason I bet he was pissed that night. God damn it. How the fuck did I not think of that? I'm the one talks about eating bones and drinking blood. What the fuck? You know what? Now I, I, I bet he was so fucking... He's like, these motherfuckers, I got, I got beat by a fucking mascot. And this fucking millennial cowboy twat Stole my goddamn gimmick. Holy shit. Someone else has to ask now to be introduced through the crowd to really blow his mind. Like, what the fuck? What are they doing? You know what they ought to do? Just to <laughs> just to fucking watch him short circuit and be carted off in a goddamn straight jacket. What's that? Every wrestler one night should enter through the crowd on the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we found a way to do a pleasant review of the Swerve Hangman match this time, but we're going to move on. A couple more matches left on this show. Twinkle Toes and Jericho against the Cucamonga Kids and their, their fight over their friendship or lack thereof in Jericho's case. And, I mean, you know, again here, Twinkle Toes will cooperate with their cheerleading routines. And Jericho... Obviously, he's not going to do a lot of that stuff, but he he got more aggressive with them because he's not their friend. And Kenny tried to get into like, oh no, give him give Maddie a break or whatever. And the Buckaroos are healing now. And I noted, I bet that FTR could have gotten a match out of Jericho and Harpo there. I'd like to see that to see what might happen. Olivier makes a couple of his awkward herky jerky comebacks and flipped around a little bit and cold tag Jericho and he made a blase comeback. When he lion salted both guys, he may have landed awkwardly on somebody. Um, I don't yeah, I'm just I took notes of a few things that happened, but this was just not only the crowd was burnt, but this is kind of dreary. I don't really. Obviously, ever watch 
buckaroos matches, but I don't know what to tell you. You watch some of these people more often than I do. Was this a standard example of what they do? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Uh, I like Omega, obviously, a little bit more than the rest of these people in the match in terms of in the ring and Jericho with the right opponent and the right situation. There's something there. The problem is, you know, all the complaints that were leveled at you a few years back by the Young Bucks and their friends and people who wanted to be friends with them, that the business had moved past you. The business had moved on. They were the cutting edge. You weren't cool with them. You weren't into them. You were out of touch. It does seem now like the whole business has kind of moved on and the Bucks are still where they were five years ago. Doesn't it? There's been no evolution other than the uh, changing color of the thinning hair. There's been no evolution in the Bucks. And the crowd reactions are less and less. They were really bad here because they followed that Swerve Hangman match. I think no matter where this was on the card, you were going to get those reactions. Kenny Omega's a main eventer. Kenny Omega's been presented as a main eventer. Adam Page still gets booed, but he's in a high-profile thing with Swerve. They could do anything with the Bucks right now. No one's going to care. The only thing they have to do is play on the fact that people think that they're douchebags because they are, but I don't even think they could successfully do that. They're teasing the whole heel turn now, and they're getting frustrated like Jericho and WCW. Look, to wish teasing a heel turn they're throwing childish tantrums at ringside and fucking kicking people in the balls i think they've more than teased it but you're right because people don't want to see them act like insufferable douchebags because they've come to realize that they really are insufferable douchebags yeah and it doesn't work if the fans aren't with you at all the young bucks lose viewers for their segments the young bucks merch which was a big thing years ago doesn't sell the young bucks themselves aren't a draw so you have a team that makes more money than any other tag team and their booking, which they have a large hand in, has been atrocious for years and now they're dead. They got the fans into this by the end of the match because those are AEW fans and they're going to pop for the finishes and everything building up to the finish. But the Young Bucks right now are dead and there's very little that can be done with them at the moment to really change that because the only thing they could do is lean into the whole thing with, you know, we're a problem backstage. We have a camp, we have a group, <clears throat> and we are in our locker room causing drama. But all it's going to do is remind people of CM Punk. And that's the last thing you need right now <laughs> in that company, right? It's the only thing everyone's going to right away think about CM Punk. That follows them. That follows them and Hangman Page into every match. Not Omega, but the Young Bucks and Adam Page, they've never been the same in those fans' eyes, and I think maybe even in their own heads since the CM Punk incident. Well, that's because I think that everybody, even I, will admit, and everybody realizes, that Kenny would never actually intentionally get in a real fight. So he kind of didn't get any of that on him. He was a victim of circumstance. But I wrote on this match uh, just a couple more notes. Dragging and a mess at the same time. Nick kicked Jericho in the balls and went to kick Kenny in the balls, but Kenny saw him, so Matt kicked Kenny in the balls. That's why everybody was multiple times kicked in the balls, and apparently we haven't heard that uh, anybody's had to go to the hospital for goddamn testicle drainage. If you're, so, in the, if you're in the back and you have these spots in your head planned out and you've already talked to your opponent, you're going to do these testicle spots, but you see other matches doing it earlier in the show, do you automatically change what you're going to do? Well, yeah, if you're paying attention, but uh, I, eh, I guess they they don't care. Cause, well, if we do it, it's different. Um, and they will still do dives like baby faces. The oh, pretty dive, but then they'll kick people in the balls to be heels. And then Jericho <laughs> ball shotted one of the buckaroos and tagged Kenny. And then Kenny milked turning on Jericho for some reason, like there was no reason for him to do that. They had had one missed miscommunication earlier in the fucking match, but, and then he beat up the Bucks, and I wrote, this won't end, more false finishes, and then Kenny hit Maddie with the one-winged fairy, one, two, three. And the Bucks roll out and they pitch a tantrum and they throw things at ringside, whatever it was that they were strong enough to pick up. 
and they're petulant children, but we already know that. It's not necessarily a a good persona to present a wrestler having on television, whether he's a baby face or a heel, but we know that's what they are in real life. It's going to be very interesting, and I apologize for the noise in the back. It's going to oh, be God. very interesting because, like I said, the Young Bucks are not what they were a few years ago. The fans aren't where they were a few years ago. And they're going to try to do something here, and it may not take. It'll be interesting. Uh, well, if the, you know, maybe they could, they could start doing this. The old deal where they stand up and turn their back on the fucking heel. Maybe if the Bucks came out, if everybody in the arena, all 1,742 of them were to just stand up and turn their backs, that would be a great atmosphere for them to wrestle in. Well, they, they've kind of done that. Instead of uh, standing and showing their backs, they've dressed as chairs. <laughs> shows. And some people are coming as remote controls. Well, now, Brian, I guess it's time for the final part of this thing. The last part. Or to quote my friend Keith Mitchell, the match we've all been waiting for, the last one. So we talked about it uh, earlier, but let's just recap. The main event for the world title in AEW, scheduled to be MJF defending against Jay White. MJF injured earlier in the night, taken to the hospital, bad leg. Adam Cole has said, it's okay. Tony said it was all right. I'll defend the title for him. So we have got the situation where Adam Cole was injured while he and MJF were the tag team champions. MJF is allowed to defend the titles by himself, and he had just picked another partner to defend the title, uh, or to defend the title with, but at least he still had it. But now, in the past, when the champion got hurt, there was no forfeit. There was a contender's match for the interim title in AEW, but now they're saying MJF has to forfeit the AEW title because he's hurt and not medically cleared to wrestle. But Adam Cole, who is not only not medically cleared to wrestle to defend the tag team title he already has, but has also just had surgery and is on crutches and in a cast, is okayed to defend the heavyweight championship that he has never held in the first place in place of the champion who's hurt. Did I do that right? Just about, yeah. Okay. So Adam Cole, they do entrances. They do in-ring introductions like it's a real match. Adam is obviously... This is not like the old Dusty or even Cody Rhodes. Oh, he's got a broken forearm. He's going to put a cast on it and fight through the pain. It's a motherfucker that cannot step on one foot. He's literally on crutches and a one-legged man. And as we mentioned before, he looks 50 years old with his straggly top-knotted hair and the beard. And, and they were taken forever with this thing like it was going to happen. And people are sitting there like, okay, you know... We expected something else besides this. And then the ambulance pulls into the back of the arena. And MJF is driving it. And he pulls to a stop and finally figures out how to open the door from the inside. I'm not sure what was going on there. And got out with one leg wrapped up and limped into the arena where his music played and he's limping into the arena with the security and the referees trying to stop him and falling because he can't stand on this leg. But he gets in the ring and de demands to be able to, and suddenly he's cleared again. And I'm, I'm not even sure, even in the preposterous days of the Attitude Era, did they go so far as to say, well, Austin's been taken to the hospital and he's not cleared to wrestle tonight, and then they let him come back in and actually have a 30-minute match, or did he just come back and stunner a few people? That may be a rhetorical question. Yeah, I, I mean, you know what the answer is to that one. But anyway, so... He, MJF throws a punch at Jay White and falls down, and Jay White takes over on his leg. And I'm thinking, okay, you know... I. I even understand what they're trying to do, but how long can they do this, right? 
and the guns are at ringside and they're getting heat on MJF behind the referee's back and they do it again twice and then finally the third time he catches them, the referee does, and he kicks them out and the gun boy's getting kicked out, got some response from the people. But then it was... <sighs> I If they had to do this, this whole thing, then Brian, don't you think, because MJF did put the psychological spots that he puts in that he knows the people want to see that will they will get with it no matter what else is going on. But there was so much time in between each. And we were expected to believe that this debilitating injury that he had suffered it was still hampering him throughout this whole thing, but they went 30 minutes bell to bell. And it would be Jay White would get heat on the leg and then MJF would throw the thing in that would get the people, like the kangaroo kick and the nip up, but then he sells the leg. And Jay White stops him again and more heat. And then MJF takes him out on the floor and he's selling the leg the whole time in, in some degree, but he puts Jay White on the desk for a big spot and the fucking desk, the announced desk, collapses into pieces under Jay White's weight before they've done anything. So MJF just puts him on top of the fucking pieces and White has to lay there for 25 seconds and MJF still goes to the top and drops an elbow off the top onto the flat floor with he landed great for him, for Jay White's sake, but not so much for his own sake. Why do that? If it, you, he shouldn't be risking again his career for something that nobody's going to remember. A hundred thousand people are going to buy this or whatever the fuck. Good God. And a lot of people have tweeted at me because I've, you know, commented at Dax's face. Well, you jumped off a scaffold on the biggest show of all time in a bump that we're still talking about after 40 fucking years. And I was a manager who didn't need to be doing drop kicks and leapfrogs, right? I don't know what the, and this was way more dangerous than it. Well, the problem too, I mean, he's going to kill his hip. But yes. once, the, once the table went down, I know you, you know, you probably have a spot in mind as the gardener does right behind me right now. You probably the have a Well, he doesn't have a chainsaw right now. He's driving around on some kind of blowing machine. Uh, I used to know a girl <laughs> like that. No, uh, but when MJF, um, I don't remember what I was saying now. Fuck. I'll say, I, I, you were remembering the blowing machine. The point is he's killing his hip, but if you got a spot like that in mind and something goes awry, modify. That's what I was trying to say before the blowing machine. Yes. And then at one point, Jay White gave MJF a rock bottom off the top rope right on MJF's left shoulder. And he would fire back and then White would stop him again. And then MJF hit a tombstone and sold his leg again. Both were selling, but it's 20 minutes in. If you had taken this 30-minute match and put MJF's little teasers that really got the people into a 15-minute match, you may have had something. That's what I was trying to say earlier, but it just, it went on. And what, MJF runs and jumps over the top rope and gives Jay White a cutter to the floor. What a move. I've never it seen anything on, like that before, ever. Never have either. It ought to be on television in an angle. But in, and it's not something that a one-legged man should do. He ran across the goddamn ring, jumped over the top rope like the Fosbury flop. And, and then why was MJF continuing to hit and slap his bad leg? Well, sometimes I've, when sometimes when you I've done that before with uh what? with my leg and different parts of the body. If they hurt like my shoulder, I'll punch my shoulder a little bit. What? He was punching his fucking hey, I've had a goddamn couple of bad legs, and I never felt like punching them to add to it. A little massage, maybe a squeeze, but punching it? Well, I mean, again, it's punching it in the massaging sense, not to hurt yeah. yourself. There's only there's only one part of my lower body that I want to beat on a regular occasion. Have you met so the blowing then, machine? 
And yeah, well, yeah, there you go. She used to live around here. And he works on the on MJF's leg more and gets the figure four so Cole can tease throwing the towel in. But then MJF, with a bad leg that he's been taking to the hospital for and couldn't stand on at the start of the match, turns the figure four. And I mean, these, these things were good, but if we've just, it's been so preposterous the way they got here. And then Adam Cole has the title belt and he th thinks about hitting Jay White with it, but Jay White grabs it while he's thinking and hits MJF with it and gets a two count. And then MJF kicks Jay White into the referee and Cole puts the ring on the mat and tells MJF to come and get it. But Jay White gets it. Didn't we just see this goddamn finish over across the street in the WWE? He put the knucks on the apron. The wrong guy got him. And this day, he couldn't throw the ring to, hey, buddy, catch. He's like, here, come get it with one fucking leg. What do you want me to do? I'm on crutches. And Jay White gets the fucking ring. But MJF hits Jay White, guess where? In the fucking nuts. And gets the ring, and the guns come in, because the referee's still down. And he nails both the guns and then nails Jay White and covers him one, two, three. 30 minutes with one leg. What'd you think? I think you picked a hell of a time to ask me to get on the mic. The guy's right outside my window. What did I think? You're driving down the road right now in your, in your hot rod, trying to get away from that question. I'm trying to think of the blowing machine. Listen. You know, after the show was over, I heard from several people who had the exact same word that they used to describe the event. And I think it was the event, but it could have been just the main event or everything leading up to it. Gardner is the word. The Gardner. word was overbooked. Yes. And again, you could say it about a lot of things on this show, but maybe best said about the main event. And I thought MJF did a great... I mean, everything he did was great. That fucking... Cut her over the rope. Yeah. Was insane. I mean, it's I've never seen the luchadors do that shit. I know one. But it also went like a half hour. And I also think it was the wrong opponent to try to do this stuff with. I, and I'm not saying that Jay White isn't talented in the ring. But if you're gonna do all this shit with MJF, it should be a strong heel. It shouldn't be just one of the heels you're trying to get. They're trying to use this to get Jay White over more as opposed to Jay White being a really over heel feuding with the world champion. Yes, and they also haven't realized that at this point they ought to just see what they could do to get Jay White to get MJF over more for somebody he might draw money with, but they haven't figured that out either. And and I, if, let me say this this way. Every, I'll finish your sentence earlier. Everything MJF did was great but much of it was out of place in this context and situation. What about that? I think that's a really good way of putting it. And again, some of the elements were almost dynamite-esque in terms of like doing the ambulance angle and him coming back. Couldn't open the door, but he figured out how to get the sirens on. I feel like I wouldn't <laughs> know how to do that. That'd be the first thing I would try to do, and I would mess that up. That's very like Monday Night War-esque. And then it was the 30-minute match. You know, so many of these matches, when you think about it, look great in highlight form. But when you're watching it, it's a 30-minute fucking match. And again, yeah. I hate to say it, but it was two matches after that swerve match. Was that a half hour? That went a it while. had to be. Had to be. Yeah, I mean, that went a long time, too. So I can't say too much else. I mean, I'm glad MJF kept the belt. They didn't really do anything with the devil character thing here. No fake rooms or windows here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I also think AEW did a good job of making everyone forget about Kota Ibushi on a bicycle with this that's, event. Uh, my God, that's true. That was just like four <laughs> or five days ago, the most embarrassing thing ever seen on wrestling television, and they've managed to top it several times since then. Well, there you go. And there it was. And there we are. And where are you?